the bursting of the comic bubble in Marvel's response, which combined the evil of Darth Vader with the coordination of Laurel and Hardy, led to a period that put the very existence of the industry in question, not to mention that of Marvel itself. Who was going to survive this, and would Marvel itself be one of them? Or would they fall victim to the mess that they contributed so largely to? Morale was terrible, but for the brand itself, the good news finally arrived right around the time that Marvel Knights hit. Marvel had finally had a huge box office success, and that success was, of all things, Blade. Now, the contract allowed Marvel a mere $25,000 for the success, but the important thing was that it showed the viability of Marvel. If a minor character like Blade could be a Hollywood success, how about the X-Men, which was coming up next through Fox? Sure enough, this too was a triumph, and although Marvel was again given a rather small amount compared to how much the film made, it proved the Marvel IP was viable in Hollywood, and Avi Arad could sell these characters to studios for far better deals. The choicest being for Spider-Man. Spider-Man had been tied up in a legal mess since 1985, when New World sold the rights to Canon, the same guys who produced the terrible Captain America and Punisher films. In 1990, when the rights were set to expire, Canon went to Perelman's Marvel. You'll remember that those are the ones who quashed Hollywood projects for stupid reasons. Well, they outdid themselves by giving an extension to Canon of forever. The way they threw that around, you'd think Perlman was dying or something. Well, Spider-Man was rescued from canon in the kind of triumph that everybody loves. Yes, of course, I'm talking about a procedural error in the bowels of an inhuman bureaucracy. It seems that neither the 1985 deal nor the extension was registered at the Copyright Office. Thus, the rights would automatically revert to Marvel if it were to ever declare bankruptcy. Which it had, yes! Our multi-year company-destroying public dick-measuring contest saved the day! So, after 15 years of Hollywood limbo, Spider-Man had returned to Marvel, and it was quickly sold to Sony for a $10 million down payment, with more to come if the film was the hit that everyone expected. That film went beyond their wildest dreams, and not only earned big bucks for everyone involved, but was a great launch point for Cusada and Jameis, as the ultimate Spider-Man book was there for those who were interested in trying out the comics for the very first time. And for the former fans who felt the twinge of nostalgia upon seeing Peter Parker and Mary Jane on the silver screen together, science fiction writer J.M. Straczynski was helming the classic Amazing Spider-Man, while Paul Jenkins of the acclaimed Inhumans explored more human tales of the wall crawler in Peter Parker's Spider-Man. Another successful decision was to emphasize the trade paperback market, which would be sold in mainstream outlets again. But instead of being the impulse buys for pocket change that they'd been for generations, now they were collected storylines submitted as a more sophisticated product. These sales proved very successful, so that the comic series themselves could be counted on to be profitable even if individual issue sales weren't. But it did come with something unpleasant, called decompression. The stories generally needed to be around four to six parts to work as trade paperbacks, so stretching out a story to fit that length became a common fixture, as well as going for generic covers as opposed to story-specific ones. It felt more and more that books were being made for the bookstores than for the monthly readers. But more traditional lines were indeed struggling. Over at Valiant's rebranded acclaimed comics, their downward spiral continued. The books had been repurposed to complement video games, but this wasn't working out for them, especially having disappointed their loyal fans with the inexplicable changes to their beloved heroes yet again. For instance, Exo Man of War ceased being a Roman era barbarian and more like a fusion between Captain America and Iron Man. Jim Shooter was invited back to create a limited series, Unity 2000, but the line folded halfway through and Shooter was left posting the notes on how things would have concluded on the web. Acclaim continued making poor business decisions, including advertising on tombstones and the infamous BMX Triple X for people who can't get enough of bicycle riding and big boobs, as well as multiple lawsuits from the Olsen twins of all people. The gaming company itself folded a few years after the comics were shut down, and the overall dignity of the human race rose sharply. Likewise, Liefeld's awesome comics wasn't doing so awesome. Alan Moore, who had been writing for some of Liefeld's books shortly before the image exit, stuck around afterwards to join Awesome, as did Jeff Loeb, working with Liefeld's creations and producing some acclaimed work there. 
But alas, there were further problems with the finances, and Liefeld's third company closed its door by the end of the millennium. It seems that the lead backer to it had financial problems. The details of this are uncertain, which I say because of a problem I have had throughout this series, which is Liefeld frequently offers a wildly different account of events than others. It's not an accusation that he's lying, it's simply a fact. For instance, he says that he changed Badrock's name after seeing the trailer for the Flintstones movie and not because any legal action was threatened or implied. Despite the fact that, as we've established, Bedrock's battle cry was Yabba Dabba Doom, so he had to know that the Flintstones existed. Suffice to say, on most of these issues, Liefeld tells a different story. Except the Agent America one, that one he agrees with. Moore quickly moved on from the collapse of Awesome Comics to create his own line within Jim Lee's Wildstorm. What Moore didn't know was that Jim Lee had grown tired of being a publisher, and at the same time that ABC was being set up at Wildstorm, Lee sold Wildstorm to DC, a hilarious and a sad way move because Moore had vowed never to return after the conflicts that he'd had with them. Liefeld wasn't surprised about the falling out this led to with Wildstorm. Quote, At some point, you have to put yourself online and go, Well, gee, Alan, is it everyone else or is it you? Says Rob Liefeld, applying for the position of least self-aware human being on Earth. He just stopped working with us because he now wanted to invest in his new universe with Wildstorm Comics. And again, like I said, oops, that went up in flames. The new line was America's Best Comics, and Moore stuck it out even when the acquisition took place because he had promised work to people while he was still at Awesome Comics and didn't want to leave them out of work because of his hatred for DC. That line that Rob Liefeld said went up in flames included Eisner Award-winning books such as The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, Promethea, Tom Strong, and Top Ten, and was considered by many to set a new standard of excellence for comics. As for Moore's views of awesome comics, he offered a scathing remark of his own. The people there were, and I quote, less than gentlemen. The softness of that remark is probably because his true ire was reserved for DC, and when he agreed to the deal, it was on two conditions— one was that the DC Bullet logo never show up on his books. And two, they worked for Wildstorm, not DC. The parent company was to never interfere in his stuff. Well, DC is a problem, see, and it's probably due to the fact that it's only missing an I and a K from its name to really describe what the company is about. So, they kept meddling anyway. One time was when a joke ad in the magazine for Marvel Douche was spotted, and the issue was pulled and revised to avoid starting anything with Marvel. Another was blocking one of the story plots because it featured events around Jack Parsons, and DC was already doing their own project that was going to reference him. Regardless of how that seems, you must remember that Moore despised DC for screwing him over Watchmen. His whole point was, I'll be professional despite how much I hate you, just stay out of my way. And when DC refused to do that, well, Moore was reaching the end of the series that he had been planning out anyway, so when it was finished, he left ABC behind. Although he kept the rights to League of Extraordinary Gentlemen this time when he left. While Jim Lee's Wildstorm was departing Image, a young writer was self-publishing a series called Battle Pope, which is exactly what you might think it'd be. Before he came to Image to work on a miniseries for Eric Larson's Super Patriot, this writer, Robert Kirkman, also worked on Tech Jacket and Invincible for Image before starting a rather unorthodox idea for a primarily superhero science fiction company like Image, an ongoing story about a zombie apocalypse. He called it The Walking Dead. Jim Valentino and Eric Stevenson rejected it, feeling it just didn't have a chance. Zombies hadn't had a successful sustained series ever, and the growing interest in zombies wasn't seen as a means to draw people in, but rather an oversaturation of the market that would leave them with a worthless book. So, Kirkman made up a massive lie, that the zombie uprising was in reality the work of invading aliens, and that there would be hints dropped throughout the earlier zombie narrative that, once the aliens were revealed, would show the tapestry of how it all tied together. So it was agreed, and by the time they figured out that Kirkman had been full of crap, the book was doing so well that nobody cared. Today, The Walking Dead is likely the most successful property to ever come out of Image, even overshadowing Todd McFarlane's Spawn, thanks in no small part to its successful adaptation to a popular live-action series on AMC. 
If we're talking about adapting, then one comic name would have to come up, and that's Dark Horse Comics. Dark Horse managed to survive and thrive throughout this period with their celebrated adaptations. Perhaps most remarkably was way back in 1990 when they had the idea to make a rather unorthodox story about two completely different properties, one being based on Arnold Schwarzenegger's Predator, the other on James Cameron's celebrated sequel to the classic science fiction horror film Alien. The story, whose title I name-dropped a few chapters back, was Aliens vs. Predator, and it made the two properties fit together like they had always been meant to be part of a single universe. And it kicked off an entirely new franchise for Fox to make use of, as well as leading to a collection of similar crossovers by Dark Horse, like Superman and Alien, or Batman and the Predator. Two years later, they did the same thing with Robocop and the Terminator, and not while to the same heights as Aliens vs. Predator, nevertheless was one sign of how Dark Horse was doing creative work with the properties of others. Even their original series, such as The Mask, Sin City, 300, and Hellboy, were successful in the reverse, leaping from comics to the silver screen. This is perhaps best seen in how the collapse of the industry impacted them. It wasn't their adaptations that suffered. It was their superhero universe that did, launched in 1993. It died just three years later. But their adaptations continued, including properties such as Star Wars, Buffy, and even Mass Effect. So like Image, they emerged into the 21st century alive and well. And as for DC itself, who had started this tale so in the toilet that they nearly lost their own characters to Marvel, for a short while they had the largest market share of the industry. They weren't exactly immune to bad decisions. The death of Superman and Nightfall had become their technique to try to draw in popular interest by causing major changes. Perhaps the most significant was the Superman Red, Superman Blue, which only did one good thing, got Superman to lose his mullet. But DC pulled through as well, absorbing various comic lines into itself, and over time in many cases, into the DC Universe proper. Its greatest success during this period, though, would probably be their adaptations. But not to the big screen. Television was where DC was finding more success. Lois and Clark, followed by Smallville, they both succeeded on television. Less successful was an earlier effort with The Flash. Not the current series, this was 25 years ago, which struggled because it was up against The Cosby Show and The Simpsons, despite an appearance by Mark Hamill, and also featuring the historically amusing team-up in The Deadly Nightshade. For anyone who has ever wanted to see Detective Munch announce the disappearance of a young Jerry Ryan, who afterwards is seen alongside Tasha Yar. But DC's unquestionable success during this period was the so-called DCAU, a number of animated series praised for their look, as well as a combination of sophistication with accessibility. Especially notable is the previously mentioned Static Shock of the defunct Milestone comics, who joins Batman and Superman as the three characters who were title characters for the DCAU. The DCAU actually influenced the comics themselves, such as the backstory of Mr. Freeze as a tragic villain, and the character of Harley Quinn, not to mention a new generation growing up with Jon Stewart as a Green Lantern rather than Hal Jordan. And, of course, Mark Hamill, once again, now is the Joker, a performance that many consider one of the best that that character ever had. Marvel was up to the same thing, following up with more films, some successes and some not, with Avi Arad serving as chairman and CEO of Marvel Studios. But then he introduced Perlmutter to David Maisel, because he had the same vision Arad had for Marvel to produce its own films. As much as the success of the films had helped wipe away the red in the account ledger, Marvel was getting a rather small portion of the box office. What their plan would be was a gamble, not unlike the Marvelution was, but with film this time. Instead of controlling the comic production from wood pulp to arrival at shops, it would be owning the rights, conceiving the project, and seeing the film all the way through production. But Maisel clashed with Arad because he had an even more ambitious plan. Let's tap the resources, put out more films, and let's use the same trick that you do with your comics. Have them be part of the same universe. It was a gamble. First, because he was not talking about the A-list. He was ready to bring in characters Arad didn't believe were strong enough to jump to the screen. And second, Arad had seen more than one Marvel film with disappointing results. The stakes were a lot higher for film than for comic books if something went wrong. But Perlmutter was sold on Maisel's idea over Arad's protests, one more thing that was driving a wedge between the two men, until Arad finally cashed out his Marvel stock and walked away. 
Not long after that was the release of the film Ghost Rider, which had been a pet project of Arad's. So he was very resentful when some early negative results came in, and Marvel reacted by distancing themselves from it. But the film went on to be a success, much to Arad's enjoyment. But it actually helped prove Maisel's point. Arad had pushed for Ghost Rider, even though by now it had seemed that the character was past his prime. If Ghost Rider can work, why can't the rest? Maisel set up a deal with Merrill Lynch, creating a $525 million revolving credit line in order to finance their films. But again, the stakes were high. If Marvel couldn't pay this time, they'd lose the movie rights to the characters. But this plan meant that Marvel could pick its own projects, pick its release dates, arrange all merchandise tie-ins, and most importantly, keep all of the profits themselves. The result of this was the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and it would grow and expand much as the books had done. Avengers films had your superheroes, Guardians of the Galaxy, your space adventure, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., your spies in the extraordinary world, Daredevil, your street-level crime fighter. With its star on the rise, the company that Ron Perlman kept trying to turn into a mini Disney received an offer in 2009 by Disney for $4.3 billion dollars a company that had once had its fate decided by a difference of one and a half million. And that brings our story back around to where it had begun. Marvel had been bought by a movie studio with a lizard, and now it was bought by a movie studio with a mouse. <laughs>